Before I pass the metaphorical microphone to Greg, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous people who have stewarded this land, otherwise known as Oregon, throughout the generations. For me specifically, this evening I'm calling in from Portland, which is the traditional land of the Multnomah, Keplamet, Clackamas, Timwater, Kalapuya, Wasco, Molala, Kaulitz, and Walala bands of the Chinook and many other tribes who made their homes near the confluence of the Columbia River and the Willamette River. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Greg Woolley. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, thank you to our panelists, and thank you for everybody that's tuning in. Uh, from what I hear, these seminars have been very successful with hundreds of folks tuning in, and there have been some great programs, and I've tuned into a couple of them myself. So thank you very much. Uh, what we'll do is start out with just some just brief introductions from our panelists, and I'll say a little bit more about myself, and then we'll go right into our questions. So let's just start this out uh, with Gloria. <laughs> thank you, Chuck. My name's Gloria Brown. I'm the author of, and this is really bad. Can you see this? Can they see this, Greg? Of Black Women. Yes, Black Women in Green is the Black title Women of the book. In Green. And I've worked for the Forest Service for 33 years, and I now live in Lake Oswego. I have three kids and four grandkids, and I am honored to be here. And I too give homage to our Native Americans whose land we are on. Okay, thank you, Gloria, and we'll hear a lot more from you after a little while. How about you, Chuck? Thanks, Greg. Nichlau and I'm in I'm Yuma. And Ashwana Shashkalash Koit Iwa Kanish Naknewe Thuma Tichamna Nichyawe Pum. Good evening, my friends and relatives. My name is Chuck Sands. My Indian name is Mockingbird with Big Heart. I come from the place of the quaking aspens of the Big Springs or the Umatilla Indian Reservation, where my people live among the Walla Walla Cayuse and Umatilla. I myself am Walla Walla Cayuse along with Yankton Sioux and Kokopa from the Southwest Arizona. And uh, I currently serve as the Deputy Executive Director for the tribes, but in my past careers, I've worked in conservation field for over 20 years. So it's a pleasure to be with this panel tonight and I appreciate Greg and Danielle inviting me to join you all. Thank you, Chuck. We really appreciate you being with us. And Tabitha, how about you? Thank you, Greg. Uh, it's definitely an honor to be here today. I am over the moon to be here and to be a part of this panel with you all. Um, as Greg said, my name is Savitha Miles King Ray, and I'm the operations supervisor for Oxbow Regional Park within uh, Metro. Um, I'm very new to this field, and I am expecting to learn a lot tonight and to gain some wisdom as we talk about these issues. Um, so thank you all again for having me. Okay, well, thank you all. And as Daniel mentioned, I'm Greg Woolley, and one of my roles is I'm Vice Chair of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission. I also have a small consulting firm called Creating Tomorrow's Workforce. I chair the board of directors of Zinger Farm and do a few other things. So I, I just try to stay as busy as I can. So we'll just go ahead and get started. And we have how much time? An hour and a half, something like that. So we'll just try to keep things moving along and we want to save time for your questions out in the audience so let's go with the first question and i'll just each i'll ask each panelist to answer the question and then i'll just answer last just as a process so first i'd like you to share an early memory of an experience in the outdoors that piqued your interest in nature and conservation uh, let's start with tabitha Thank you, Greg. Um, I love this question and I love telling people this story because it definitely comes from fishing uh, in my home state of Louisiana. Uh, I grew up fishing on the swamps and bayous with my dad and my sister and my later my brother. And it definitely piqued that interest of being outside and being in nature. And it's something that I carried when the first time I went down to Oxbow uh, Regional Park and I looked at the Sandy River, saw people fishing with their children. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is a fantastic park for families. It was a fantastic park to hike and to to just be out in nature. And it was always a healing space for me, just to kind of process your thoughts and think, you know, as you're quietly holding this fishing pole, waiting for the for the sink, the bobber to go under. So it's definitely that that's that memory that I take with me. And 
when those experiences and people get to come back and tell me about those experiences, it's what uh, makes me realize why I love what I do so much. So definitely fishing out in Louisiana for me. Okay, thank you. And what part of Louisiana were you in? Uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Baton Rouge, all right. All right, Chuck, how about you? Do you have an experience you'd like to share that kind of early in your in your life that kind of really piqued your interest about the conservation I can, I can go back to about age five. Um, and my grandfather regularly took me out, uh, my paternal grandfather, the late Charles F. Sams Sr., uh, out into the reservation uh, onto the number of waterways that feed into the Umatilla River. And we were on a place called Esculpa Creek uh, on the east side of the reservation, and he handed me this rock. Mm -hmm. And he would tell me that I'm going to ask you questions from time to time about the rock. And that began my formal education of understanding my environment. And he would ask me how I thought the rock was formed, how it got into the stream, how it moved down that stream to the river, how, who walked over that rock, who was here before us when this rock was formed. Um, it taught me math, it taught me science, it taught me history, but more importantly, it taught me that I am no better, no worse than this rock. And that more importantly, this rock had a life. Now, our Western science tells us that, you know, rocks are inanimate, hard objects. My, my people have told me since time began, everything has a life and a spirit in it. And this rock has been my primary teacher. My grandfather, of course, was it in real life, but he used the specific for me to get to the general so that I understood the interconnection of the environment and the most important thing, place, and what that plays in a people and in the minds of each other and how we can go and protect and conserve that which we love the most. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. I just appreciate that you kept that from your yeah. grandfather, and I'm sure that it will pass down in future generations, and in that story will continue to be told. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. Gloria, do you have an experience early in life? I do. Um, it was when I left Washington, D.C. to come to the Pacific Northwest for the first time. I was about 34 years old. I grew up in Washington, D.C. And someone took me to one of the wilderness um, by, I can't even remember the name of the falls, but he took me in there and I'd never been in such a, I'd never been in an environment like that. It was the birds were singing, there was no one around, it was quiet, it was beautiful, and I thought I had entered the cathedral. And as far as I was concerned, that's where I left my heart, and I had to come back in order to be able to follow my heart. And in that setting, and a lot more after that, I, mm -hmm. ga I gained a significant respect for our environment and without it the soil the rocks the flora the flora the animals the trees the salmon we won't be here mm -hmm. we won't be here that's so true well for me it, it started probably with my parents uh, they were married in yosemite in 1946 so even before in utero, uh, there was already some exposure. And, and I think th they were probably the only black folks in Yosemite in the entire park in 1946, th them and a couple of friends that they brought to be witnesses to their wedding. And then when my sister and I were young, they brought us to Yosemite. And so I, at a very young age, I was just awed by the, by the grandeur and, and the scale of, of what nature can be. And that inspired me, I think, as a kid to just start collecting all kinds of things that crawled and slithered and hopped and, and swam. So I had a lot of different odds and ends kinds of pets as a child. And my parents were very tolerant of that. <laughs> and I think I, I led my first field trip when I was probably about nine years old in, in an empty lot that hadn't been developed yet in my neighborhood. And but still there were there were rabbits running around and grasshoppers and things like that. So I think that was probably my first sort of junior naturalist experience that I had leading a trip. 
So thank you for that. Thank you. How did you come into the natural? So I just want to backtrack. So, so it's interesting. There are two of us that had very early childhood experiences, and then there are two of us that, that really we really came into it as adults. So I think as we go along, we'll, we'll have some different stories and perspectives as we go along. And, and I think it helps also people to, to see that you can enter the conservation field you know, at different points in your career. You get turned on, you get excited, you want to learn more, and you say, hey, you know, you might even switch careers, you may just do something completely different. So it's never too late. So how did you come into the natural resources profession as an adult? So just briefly tell your story. You kind of started on yours, Gloria. Uh, maybe you could kind of expand on that, how that kind of well, turned into a career. I, I would just say after my husband died, I was actually in school for journalism and I was going to be a reporter. But he died when I was 30 years old and I was working for the Forest Service. After that field trip, I told my children, we're going to live there one day. And the way we would be able to do that is that I could not go into print, radio, TV, media. I have to stay with the Forest Service and it will take me and you to all these beautiful places. Great. Tabitha, how about you? Um, how did this initial experience your fishing experience and your love for that i mean did it how did that translate into actually a, a, a career that you're in now it's a it's an interesting little story but a uh, complete accident <laughs> i wish that i really wish i knew about uh conservation work and working out in parks uh before because i think it would have totally changed um what i went to college for in in the and it would have changed what my perspective of life would have been, but it was just surely by accident. Um, I was looking for a wedding venue and we went to Oxbow Regional Park because uh, the prices were reasonable and it was outside and the pictures looked great. And as we were driving into the park, uh, I was just like, my jaw hit the ground. And I was just like, I've never seen a place like this. Like, it's a totally different type of beauty than you get from in Louisiana. And I was like, this is like the forest in the movies, you know, and I was walking around and I was just like, if I could work here and be a part of this work to protect this. And then in that, I learned about Estella Ellaby and her work to protect particularly Oxbow Regional Park and its ancient forest. And I was like, there's already a legacy here and a path already here for me if I can try and pursue it. Um, so I did my research and I applied for this position and this is my first position in uh, environmental work and it has been a huge learning curve and it's been a lot of roller coaster of things but every single day I'm learning something new and I'm learning from people who have been in this work and who have put their passion and this has been their life work and I foresee it being mine as well as, as the years go on um, because it's just something that once it gets in you you just cannot you can't let those trees go you can't once you make that connection, I think with these outdoor spaces, you just can't let them go at the end of the day. So um, definitely a, a not a career path I was heading towards just because I didn't know it was there, but I'm so glad, I'm so, so glad I'm here now. Mm -hmm. that, that reminds me of just the impact of someone from the South seeing really big trees for the first time. I had the privilege of <laughs> taking Mike Espy, who was former uh, agriculture secretary, when he came out, when we, un we unrolled the forest plan, when I worked for the Forest Service, and I had him up on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and I, I was managing the, the media and stuff then, and, and we, we took that stroll, and he looked up, and he was just floored to Thanks. see the, the cathedral of those trees. I think the biggest yeah. trees were maybe tupelos, which are, you know, those get kind of big, but they're yeah. not like old growth forest in the Northwest. No, I can believe it, it is, it is, jaw dropping <laughs> you just like they just keep going and going and going <laughs> yeah so check uh, how, did, how did your initial experiences in nature and the outdoors how did that translate into a career for you you know at, in high school i worked for the youth conservation corps on the reservation prior to joining the service and so i'd been exposed to the forest service and working outdoors but that wasn't my aspiration my aspiration was to go into the military and I went into the Navy and I'll date myself very clearly. I'm, I'm an ex-Soviet analyst of the late 1980s. I also speak Russian. And um, 
I was working um, in intelligence work and working for an attack squadron in Fallon, Nevada, when a bomb errantly went off of the range and blew up accidentally on a state park. And uh, one of my collateral duties was the environmental protection officer. And the only reason why I got that job was because I could write technical reports. And so whenever there was a, an environmental accident within the squadron, my job was to make sure it got cleaned up and then write the technical report to the Department of the Navy and to the EPA. And I got out in the field with a crew working alongside folks from uh, the Nevada Parks and Recreation, the Nevada Outdoor folks, and BLM, Forest Service folks, and we had to do a restoration project. And I thought, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. As much as I love intelligence work, maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And when I got out of the intelligence work and went to college, I still had that feeling that I wanted to do work in intelligence. So I was finishing a degree in international studies when my grandfather came to visit me, along with the director of natural resources for the Umatilla tribes, the late Mike Farrow, and uh, Anton Minthorn, former chair of the Umatilla tribes. And the three of them asked me what I was doing. How is this going to help your people? How is this going to fulfill the covenant you have as an, an, as an Indian person to be the protector and preserver of our landscape? So right then and there, I changed my degree. And I ended up working for over 20 years in the environmental field. But it all started by happenstance for me and a collateral -like duty that I had while I was in the service. <laughs> Did you ever miss that intelligence work? You know, I, I still do. I'm not going to lie. I still do. It, it's some interesting work. Mm, it sure is. Well, for me, it, it really started my, with my first job out of college, and so I had a, a girlfriend at the time who lived in Pasadena, and she was kind of situated there in that city and had received two job offers, and so she took one job offer and she referred me to the other job, which was to for an organization called Outward Bound Adventures. And it's not the Outward Bound Survival School that a lot of people are familiar with. It's a nonprofit organization based in Pasadena. It started in the 1960s by a, a middle school science teacher. And so I became a trip leader. Um, didn't really know much about backpacking at the time. I'd, I'd worked with kids, but I just had a conversation with the, with the executive director and she said, okay, you're hired. And that was it. And so we took kids out. My group of students were from Los Angeles and, and East LA. Large uh, percentage of African American kids, also Latinx kids, white kids. It was it was a mix of kids, but a lot of low income kids. We had kids from Watts, uh, from the projects there in Watts, and uh, in and in East LA. So most of my trips were out in the desert, and so I backpacked these kids out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, for three days at a time, and it was you know, pretty mind blowing for them. And it was a time in where uh, you know there was gang activity in Los Angeles, and you know these kids were surrounded in, in really kind of rough areas, a lot of them. But once they got out in the desert, didn't matter you know what color your shoestrings were or what way your hat was turned or anything. I mean, all that stuff had to fall to the wayside because they were more worried about scorpions and tarantulas and uh, they, were even, they were even afraid of coyotes a lot a lot of the kids but so it, so it was a big change for them but you could bet after that weekend Monday morning that's all they talked about was the trip when they got back to school they, they were they were so excited and proud of, of the accomplishments that they had so that's how I got started uh, you know working with youth and environmental education and then it, it moved into other things I got interested in decisions that were made about land and I worked for the Nature Conservancy and worked, did regional planning for Metro and worked with Forest Service. So it just kind of, it took off from there. That it was first, started out with those trips that I took out uh, with those kids. All right. So have you had any particular challenges as a person of color working in natural resources? Tabitha. I know that it's kind of kind of new field for you, but you know what what's it been like as as a, a woman of color? Uh, you have a lot of responsibility with Oxbow Park. You you come across a lot of people. Uh, you work with an organization, Metro. It's still you know a predominantly white led organization. Uh, so what's it been like? 
Um, I think, yeah, it's uh, definitely still very new for me, um, but it's some of those same challenges that you see anywhere when it's a predominantly white organization, albeit trying to change and trying to grow, but still very um, not as diverse as we is it like would like to be. Um, so I would say two things. Um, one is a little funny, but it's when you have a, maybe a guest who's a little frustrated about a situation and say, oh, I want to speak to the supervisor. I show up, I get out the truck and they're like, no, 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 I want to speak to the supervisor. I'm like, I, I am the supervisor. How can I help you today? And the look on some people's faces are just like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> and th the whole conversation then shifts. Like sometimes even the anger is diffused because they're like, well, that's not what I was expecting. They're a little thrown off. Uh, and then we take care of the situation. Um, and the other one is a little bit uh, more difficult to navigate. It's the uh, sometimes if you're the only person of color in the room speaking up about issues, it, I feel like it tends to shift into thinking that this is something that you personally feel or you personally have an opinion on, not realizing that, no, you're saying this because you're representing an entire people sometimes, you know, and what more than you, if it was more than just one person in the room, others would most likely agree with the point of view or the concern. And I think that one is one that uh, rather recently, especially with so many people taking up the charge to educate themselves about uh, systematic oppression and what's been going on after um, the murder of George Floyd, I've seen a big shift in that awareness and that understanding and just wanting to dive more into that comment instead of just say, oh, okay, yeah, I see your point. Like, no, 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 it's not just my point. This is a bigger, this is a huge issue that I'm trying to raise and trying to talk about here. Um, there's definitely been a shift there. But um, for me, just, yes, very new into this, that those are my two things that kind of, one tickles me, one not so much at the end of the day. Well, I think that's really an upside of all, all of this is just the conversations that people are having. Uh, people just yeah. do more reading, more research, mm. looking at podcasts, and just really being hungry to learn and understand more about a lot of things that a lot of us have you know, dealt with all of our lives. Uh, so it's it's better late than never. You know, it's okay to be late to the party because there's a lot of work to do and everybody has to be involved to do it. So that's terrific. Uh, so Gloria, you have quite a story, oh, okay. story career there with the Forest Service. How, well, there, there must have been a few challenges along the way. I talk about it was all challenging. You can imagine a East Coast female GS4 wanting to be a for a supervisor, and I could not even speak the language. It was a different language to be um, a forester or someone in the Pacific Northwest. And none of the guys, they, they did not believe me when I said I wanted to be a decision maker because I did not like some of the, the decisions they would make. So I was challenged in a whole lot of ways. And I'll just mention one. The biggest challenge was my first forest supervisor job. And they gave me a boat with all kinds of leaks in it. I, 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 was, I was doomed to drown. And I was, not gonna, I was not gonna let that happen that the first black woman as a forest supervisor would go under like that. So one of the first things I did, because I didn't have any money, I wasn't, cut, I wasn't cutting old growth, so I didn't have any money. And that's how a lot of forests made their money. They cut old, old growth. And I made the announcement that I was not going to. So then I'm, I'm like, okay, what, what can I do? The first thing I had to do was get out from under the injunction. Mount Hood, Sayusla, uh, Gifford Pinchot and the Willamette. All four were under injunction. They couldn't do anything. And so I went to the environmental groups and I introduced myself. I asked them to look at my record in the past and, and give me a chance. Give me a chance. And, and, the, and the biggest chance I need to start with was getting me out from under that, that injunction so I could continue to do second growth logging. And the last part of it, I needed money. I needed money really fast. And partnerships were, were new at that time. But Ecotrust had this big funding of the Yellow Bowl. 
and they picked my forest. One of the reasons is because I said I would not cut any more old growth and, and infuse dollars to do projects with watersheds or with watershed councils on the ground. And so I think what, what the guys did not understand, they knew trees, they knew wildlife, they knew fish, but they didn't know people. They did not know how to work with people who were not white and upper class, whatever they thought they were. And, and I came to be a change agent and that's why I was challenged so many times. Mm. Terrific. Well, thank you for that. Chuck, how about you as a, as a native person uh, here, you know, in, in the U United States and, you know, within the Northwest and in Oregon, you know, did you find any challenges that were just specific to, to being a, a, a man of color and an Indian person uh, in, in the conservation field? I did. You know, I, I spent several years with the Earth Conservation Corps, which is, at the time was a national organization based out of Washington, D.C., and I was their um, Western director, but eventually I became its executive director and chief executive officer and president, and I was 30 years old, just turned 30, and um, I was fortunate my, my board chair uh, was Ethel Kennedy, um, the late Robert F. Kennedy's wife, and um, she decided since uh, it, it was the year 2000, and uh, we were having a person of color head a national organization that she would th uh, throw a party over it. And so we went to National Geographic and we had uh, my coming out as the chief executive officer in the Hubble room. And I remember getting up before my peers of the other national organizations in the District of Columbia and um, looking across a room and not seeing anybody like me, A, eh? uh, let alone seeing any other person of color in the room. And it was shocking that as we were entering a new century that we didn't have more people of color leading national organizations, more people of color even staffing national organizations that work in the environmental and conservation field. And what the real challenge came for me was in the fundraising aspect. And that lasted for almost 15 years, from 2000 to 2015 of, and I, funny for some folks uh, in the picture that was distributed uh, by Oregon Wild my hair was still long and my hair was still long until the beginning of this year and it's short and what I noticed in funding when my hair was long I didn't get as much funding for my programs but when my hair was short I could get all kinds of funding when my hair was long funders and grant makers and foundations would talk to me slow and deliberate when I had short hair and it was just like I was anyone else. And I wasn't the only one that noticed that. My development director for the Earth Conservation Corps uh, it was Scott Welch, who most folks know in the Portland metro area, who works for Columbia Sportswear and does a lot of their foundation giving. And Scott was the one that really pointed it out to me how ridiculous this was as a white man that he would notice that when my hair was long, I got talked down to. When my hair was short, I had a perfectly fine conversation. Nothing changed about my education, my background, my position. Mm -hmm. It had to do with my hair. And so I think the challenge that I faced as, as a leader of Earth Conservation Corps, a leader of um, the Columbia Slough Watershed Council, the Community Energy Project, or uh, even with the Trust for Public Land as its National Director of Tribal Native Lands, is the fundraising aspect with foundations and grant givers, and that would include federal agencies and state agencies who provide funding. Um, my counterparts, um, uh, you know, I work very closely with uh, Bowen Blair, who was the chief conservation officer for Earth Con or for uh, Trust for Public Land. And when we spun off, uh, he thought that it wouldn't be that hard to raise funds because we both knew funders everywhere. But Bowen, uh, as and I was the chief executive officer of Indian Country Conservancy, but they would always defer to talk to Bowen over me. And that really bothered Bowen. He didn't realize how ingrained uh, racist attitudes were within the environment until we had to go out and fundraise and watch folks dismiss me as the executive director and go to my vice president and uh, willing to listen to him and provide funding for it. So that was a huge challenge. I still see it. And I can only imagine that it hasn't really gone away. 
for anybody who is a person of color in a leadership role within the environmental and conservation field. Well, thanks for sharing that, Chuck. And, and it just speaks to kind of what we have to deal with when people first see us, right? Either, either it's skin color, it's how we wear our hair, it may be a manner of speaking, and, and they have to get past that first sometimes to actually see us and hear us. And it, it's, it's an additional burden uh, and, and extra work sometimes that we have to do. Uh, for me, uh, I work for the Nature Conservancy and I was a preserve manager in the Bay Area. And I was the first preserve manager. So I'm gonna date myself as well. This is the mid eighties, okay. And so, there weren't any preserve managers of color in California, and and I think there were at that time pretty much zero nationally, and and also just people of color working in the science division of the Nature Conservancy. The Conservancy wasn't as big as it is now, and it wasn't as global. They had an international program, but it was only in Latin America at the time. And so I remember the first gathering of preserve managers in California. Uh, we had a we had a conference for a few days, and so I asked my my boss, who was the, the state stewardship director, and, and, and because I noticed, you know, there was all the preserve managers are white. And I said, well, are there any other preserve managers of, of color, uh, you know, in California? And he said, you're the only preserve manager this side of Nairobi. Okay. And so, um, you know, and I didn't feel offended by that. I mean, he was just trying to say that I'm it. And so, again, just kind of being the first and the only you know, as as all of us have, have experienced, you know, I, I've experienced that. And so now as a commissioner for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, I'm involved with an organization called WAFWA, it's the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, which is pretty much Rocky Mountains West. And there are other similar organizations in the Southeast and in the Northeast. And so I've been working for two years to, to develop a diversity and equity uh, committee for our organization. Uh, there's one for the East and there hasn't been one in the West. And so about three summers ago, we hosted the national, the, uh, the, the conference here in Oregon. And I was uh, kind of pressing the service at the last minute to give a keynote right toward the end. And we, for the summer conferences, we have you know, 400 people or so, 450 people. And it was, it was a sea of, of white faces. And, and so I ended up, tailoring my uh, my keynote talking about the diversity and the lack of diversity and really challenging the other state agencies uh, the other fish and wildlife agencies to to start to develop some change and so now we do have a we now have a committee and we just met for the first time for our summer conference which of course had to be virtual this year but we had over 50 people attend our meeting and so now we're, we're launched and, and we're, we're going now Congratulations. Yeah. So do you have a high point in your career that you'd like to share? Thank you. Oh, Gloria's ready to go. All right, let's, let's only let her because, go. Only because of several things that Chuck said. A high point in my career, I was the area manager in Baker City, which is on the east side of the Cascades. The Nez Pierce Indians came to my office and ask me if I could get some of their tribal land back. This guy had just taken it over. And I told them, it, you know, I would definitely go for it. And so my staff did several maps and we took it to the guy as a transfer. If you give me these lands back so we could get it, give it to the Ms. Pierce, then we will give you this. Every suggestion, everything we took to him, he said no. I didn't have money. All I had was land that I could use. So I went back to my office and I said, I, I can't go back and tell Miss Pierce that, that I couldn't do this. So, Chuck, I called Tr Trust for Public Lands because I had worked with them before. And I asked, I said, guys, I've done everything I can with this guy and he will not turn over these tribal lands. And Trust for Public Lands got involved. Um, many of you, some of you know how they work. 
They were able to get the land back. The Nez Tears had this big, big celebration, giving me the credit, but it was really trust for public lands. And unlike people might think, I'm, I'm very humble. I'm, I'm always humble, but I was, that was one of my best um, memories, uh, being able to do that. And the fish was good too. Just yeah. it was good. Well, Gloria, the Trust for Public Land made the deal happen, but that it was your initiative to reach out. It was your people's skills uh, that, that made it happen. So when you let that one go. Okay, Chuck, how about how about you? Do, do you have a high point that you'd like to share with us about your you know, career? I have a couple. My first one was working with the Trust for Public Land and um, most people know the the sad history of Hawaii, and that you know the United States enact, an, annexed Hawaii illegally, uh, dethroned their queen, uh, pushed out their parliament, and took over the territory. And the native Hawaiians, up until uh, around 2009, uh, 2008, 2009, only had about 1,500 acres of their land in their name. And I had the great opportunity of working with the uh, Pele um, Defense Fund and uh, a number of uh, Native Hawaiian organizations with our office in Hawaii to help them secure Weokile Opuna, uh, which was 20,000 acres of land returned back to actual Native Hawaiian control. And to watch the joy of the my, my fellow relatives of Hawaii to know that they finally were back into their own rainforest lands on the Big Island, uh, that they had access to their traditional foods and to their traditional waters and ways that they can get back to their prayer sites was something that was truly moving to me. And I'd done a number of projects for tribes in the United States, but to actually see my relatives in Hawaii uh, overjoyed that they finally had their land returned back to them probably is one of my highlights of my professional career in conservation. The second one was. Uh, working in Portland and realizing again uh, while I was in Portland that there were very few people of color. And the late Charles Jordan uh, thought that we were having breakfast one day and he really wanted me to meet a guy by the name of Marcelo Bonta. And Marcelo, uh, who is super enthusiastic uh, as a conservationist and also had seen that there were not very many people of color. So he put out the challenge to actually start the environmental people of color luncheons. And it was just a small group of us at first, four or five of us. It is now a network that crosses across the United States with chapters in Washington, DC and Oakland, California and San Diego. But more importantly, uh, working with Marcelo, working with Desiree Williams and Tony DeFalco, uh, we were the founding board members to set up the Center for, for Diversity in the Environment to really go and tackle the mainstream organizations and governments and have them face the reality that they were missing an entire group of people. As people of color grew and are continuing to grow to be the largest segment of the population, uh, we recognized that mainstream organizations were just not prepared to deal with that change. They weren't prepared to deal that people of color are and want to be part of the solution of conservation and environmental work. And now I can proudly look back as one of the founding board members uh, with Marcelo and Desiree and Tony and watch and see what Keta has done, Gonzalez has done with CDE. And uh, those two are probably the highlights thus far of my environmental and conservation career. I hope to enjoy several more um, as time goes by, but those those really come to light for me each time I look back. So thanks, Chuck. And I have a lot of appreciation also for the Center for Diversity and the Environment and Environmental Professionals of Color. And they continue to do fantastic trainings and, and organizations, agencies, and, and nonprofits have, have changed their, pretty much changed their entire mission in a lot of ways because of going through the training that they've provided. And I, I went through it, I was the, the second cohort to go through their training. And it's um, it, it can change the way people work and the way people think about what their responsibilities are. In my case, you know, I worked on the Mount Hood National Forest and I hadn't, the, the Forest Service has an international program. And so they would kind of farm out employees sometimes on special assignments around the world. And so uh, since I had background in conservation education, 
I was asked to go to Swaziland in southern Oregon, southern uh, Africa, and and teach a course. And I was paired with another person, and I went to Swaziland. So uh, the training that I had was sponsored by the National Park Service, the Peace Corps, and uh, the Forest Service. So when I got down to um, to Swaziland, uh, well. First of all, nobody was there at the airport, and I was on the other side of the world for the first time, and it was getting darker and darker. And the kids that were there at the beginning, they were on the roof of the little airport waving. They were all gone. All the people were gone. All that was there was a, a really big guy with a, with a very large rifle. And so I was trying to talk with him about, you know, how do I even get to the place I'm supposed to stay that night? So anyway, that was kind of my my non welcome when I got there. But anyway. Uh, so the cool thing was we taught the course at a wildlife preserve. And so we got to, to live there and teach there. And I used a lot of curriculum that I had here in the US and adapted it just to, to African wildlife in, in African conservation. So, so it worked out really well. The one thing that we didn't plan on was that the training was for Peace Corps volunteers and also for teachers in Swaziland but it was the King's birthday and it was the 25th anniversary of independence for Swaziland. So all the teachers had the day off. So we had to get teachers from Zimbabwe and, and you know, a couple of neighboring countries, some administrators from there to come to be our students along with our Peace Corps volunteers. But that was a, that was a, a wonderful and rare opportunity that I had. Um, and, um, I learned more about the Peace Corps. I wasn't a Peace Corps volunteer myself, but I became an in-service trainer. I was, I was an in-service trainer for the Peace Corps uh, because of that experience. So that was, that was a real highlight for me. What advice would you give? Let me do a time check too. Let's see, we're at yeah. 6.51. How are we doing, Danielle? Greg, we didn't do Tabitha. Oh, I'm what sorry. And Tabitha, I also, um, my apologies. Uh, so do you have a high point? And again, your, your career is rel relatively new, but you've had a, 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 a crash course, a concentration there at Oxbow Park. And so uh, share a high point with us. Thank you, Gloria, for, for catching me on that. So how about that, Tabitha? Well, I do not have a story that can compare. Those were three amazing experiences. And I just, I was jotting notes as you all were talking because I just learned so many things in so many organizations. Um, but um, I was really thinking about this question and I would just, I, albeit very short, I would just have to say for now, it's definitely been navigating this summer uh, with the team, with COVID. We've been open since we've never closed, you know, and just navigating um, how do we protect ourselves? How do we continue to protect the public adjustments that we make? And my team has, has just stepped up in new ways. We've all leaned on each other in new ways to support and carry each other because it's not, you know, our park is not the only thing for us in our lives right now. All we want it to be, but it's, there's so many other things happening. And so just really being there for each other and just providing that space um, for public to come heal. We've had so many people who have come, unfortunately, to have a, a remembrance of life services for, for families that they've lost at the park. And they, they always say, well, my loved one loved this park so much, and that's why we're here. And just to be able to, to, to allow that to not block that experience and that healing is phenomenal. But um, so thus far, it's definitely been navigating the summer, learning my team better and supporting each other in this difficult time. And thank you, yeah. Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, hearing other people's stories can be a high point too, I, I think, in our lives. And you know, there's so much pent-up demand to get outdoors, and you know, all of our outdoor places in Oregon have just been slammed with people, and it's really pressed staff, you know, with state parks, national forests, and uh, folks are, are rolling with it because uh, there's there's so many benefits from being for being outdoors. So thanks, Tabitha. What advice would you give to a young person of color that is interested in entering the natural resources field as a profession? Um, Chuck, we haven't started one with you. So what, what advice would you give to a young person? I tell them, remember that you're going to be an educator first. One of the issues, because there are so few of us that are in the actual natural resources and environmental field, um, we're obviously called out time and time again to 
express everything we know about people of color, regardless of what person of color you may be. And uh, when I was younger in my field and even in my later age now, um, I, I used to get upset of having to constantly be the educator, but it's actually a good place to be in. As Gloria had said, you know, when you know how to work with people, um, all those other things can help fall into place. And if you can learn to be articulate and a good instructor and a good educator uh, and an ambassador, uh, not only for your own people, but for other people of color, you open up doors, you open up minds, and you open up new experiences for everyone. Because the environment loves diversity. Diversity is the natural environment. And it's explaining to the dominant society that without it, you too will die. Diversity is key to the conservation field and to our environment so that we can enjoy it for generations to come as it is to the human life form. And that we should celebrate that diversity as we have in our environment, but also among ourselves. And so I want young people coming in here to not be afraid to speak up, not be afraid to share their experiences, not be afraid to be that ambassador uh, for people of color to help uh, the natural resource field expand and grow and become stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think young people are, are less reticent these days to, to speak their mind and speak their voice. I think some of us were kind of feeling our way through this profession and uh, being maybe a little meeker and milder. Uh, but, I, but I have a lot of faith in, in the young folks these days that, that, they're gonna, that they're gonna speak up. And, and this is the other thing I would say before we move on, and I know sometimes it can feel a little burdensome to, to be the educator, but I, you know, I feel that there's no such thing as an awkward question. I just appreciate that someone is curious enough and interested enough to ask a question. And I would encourage anyone uh, to just, if, if you're curious, if there's something that you don't understand and you know, put yourself in, in a space that may be a little less comfortable for you, um, but, but everybody benefits. You benefit, um, we all benefit because we're, we're all on some kind of learning curve. If you'd allow me to an example is that, you know, when I work for the Trust for Public Land, which is a wonderful organization, and, and I would go back to work for them today, they have um, the staff there, when I worked there, was over 500. 95% of the staff held a, at least a bachelor's degree. 70% of the staff held a professional degree, whether that was a, a being an attorney or a master's uh, in planning. Um, but when I used to train on tribal lands issues, every year we would hold a major training for programmatic staff. And I would send out a questionnaire as part of my training to allow them to ask me any question that they had about Indians. And every year for the five years that I was there, I would still get questions. Do Indians live in teepees? Do you not have to pay taxes? Do you get a free education in college? You know, um, and does the government provide you funding uh, on a monthly basis? Now, this is what I would consider one of the most well-educated organizations in the United States. But that that ignorance, uh, that lack of education uh, about people who have been here since time immemorial, uh, it it finally stopped shocking me, and I realized it's not their fault. It is the United States education system's fault, and therefore they're being brave enough to ask those questions, and I have to be smart enough and kind enough and compassionate enough to say, yeah, we have something both to learn from each other here. Let's talk about these issues so thanks for allowing me that but yeah yeah, yeah. education system and just the, you know the cultural isolation that, yeah. that so many folks grow up into in, the, in their own bubbles with their their friends their workplace their neighbors and, and just not have not having that experience of really putting themselves in other spaces so tabitha what advice would you give to a person of color a young person that's interested in entering the conservation field uh, i first want to say thank you so much chuck for that answer because that is something i've been personally struggling with is, you know, not always willing to be the educator. And I know my mom who is listening is, has applauded that answer <laughs> because she herself is the educator. My father was an educator for 40 plus years. And the amount of patience that that involves is something that I think I had kind of lost. I had spent four years uh, teaching English in Southeast Asia before coming to Oregon and just being asked every question imaginable about African-Americans and or just Africans not realizing the distinction sometimes between uh, African Americans and Africans. So I came back to America with a huge lack of patience for 
for that that topic in particular being questioned about things. So I, I will take that personal check and, and reset that button in myself. Um, but uh, I would say uh, definitely to just piggyback what Chuck was saying, uh, know that the the hopefully uh, if me being a younger person doing this is a testament to that it's changing and it will continue to change but know that it's not going to be an easy road to change and being prepared for that being prepared to be to question things within yourself and how what you know what is your reasons for doing these things and being able to fall back on it because it's not just we don't have the luxury of just going to work you have the luxury of going to work and representing so many times every day sometimes and that you have to have that thing inside you that makes you go, this is why I'm doing this. This is why it's important. This is why I'm gonna answer this question, even though I feel like it's ridiculous, I'm gonna do it today. So whatever it is, and there are times in my mind in a meeting, I'll go back to being that kid fishing off the back of the boat and just find that peace <laughs> from that moment. And I'm like, this is where I am just for five seconds. Okay, now let's get back to the topic at hand in the meeting. So finding the reasons why you're doing it and, and hanging on to that. And uh, as, as you grow, keep grabbing onto new things and new experiences and new reasons. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you for that. Gloria, how about you? What, what advice would you give to, to a young person wanting to uh, embark on a career like we've had? Uh, I, I would start with the story of how, <clears throat> how good forest service has been to me in working in natural resources. And I will talk about the Sayusla watershed that we totally rehab. We took dikes out, we took roads out, we redid the stream, we planted um, cottonwoods, and they came back. The fish came back. Imagine this, somebody that wants you to work for them to bring our environment back. And that you would want your kids to enjoy, but they can't enjoy it unless you do the work that I did. And my watershed improvement project got me to Brisbane, Australia as one of the three top watersheds in the country. How fantastic is that young people? This could be you. This could be your story. And we need African-Americans, black, whatever we're calling ourselves now, we need that story because we came from a people who knew all about the land. No, we're not Africans, but aren't we? Aren't we? They knew about the land. People, we need you. Do not be afraid of that sea of whiteness. That's why we need you because of that sea of whiteness. And don't you want to have us at the table while they're making decisions about something that belongs to us? The public lands belong to the people. Do not be afraid. Persevere. Find a mentor. Find a guide. I'll guide you. But please, please think about a job in conservation, it doesn't have to be the Forest Service. Um, there are all kinds of resource agencies, conservation agencies, nonprofits that you can join. Just join. Just join and do the hard work. And that's what I would tell you. Okay. Well, thank you, Gloria. I think my response would be kind of a combination of, of all of yours. I think one, Kind of going along with Tabitha, just really follow your heart, follow what really inspires you. And if you're out in nature and you're you're in a state of awe and wonder and, and curiosity, try to figure out how you can you can be in that place 
for your whole life and actually get paid for it. That that was a surprising thing to me when I started taking those kids out to the desert. I thought, wow, I get I get paid for this. I get to backpack and I get to be out and watch amazing sunsets and and smell sage and you know all the the aromas of, of the desert and this is a pretty good gig. So you know, follow your heart if, if it excites you. And then as Gloria said reach out to people that are in the field. I mean, there are a few more of us now. Mm -hmm. So just ask questions, you know, ask the questions that I'm asking the panelists and um, get a feel for, for what the careers are. And we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that. But uh, I think in my role, and I think maybe in some of us that have been doing this for a while, we, we find ourselves to be mentors. And I'll, I have a question about mentors. Uh, next, but you know, I find myself uh, being approached by young, primarily young men of color uh, from a range of backgrounds. I and mean, one person is from Eritrea, another one that's uh, families from Peru, another one's from the Middle East, um, that are at these kind of career decision points, and, and maybe they want to make a shift. A couple of them are trying to, to get out of the tech field, and they want to do something more with people. And they love being in the outdoors and they want to know, well, how can I combine that together? So um, that's what I would tell people, you know, follow your heart and, and seek out people and, and ask a lot of questions. And, and you can, we're kind of evolved to the point where we can actually provide some answers and, and some suggestions and some recommendations. So thanks. Uh, so how important is a mentor? And did you have a mentor? And if so, how did they help your career? Uh, who wants to jump up on that one? I know I know you've had some mentors, Gloria, that really helped you a lot. Uh, yes, so, I have. You can Can I do it first? Go go right ahead. Sure. Sorry, I've had a lot of mentors, and believe it or not, the mentors I had to go to were white men because there were no people that looked like me. So I watched and I listened and I knew them very, very well. And I knew which ones to pick to say, you know, this is what I'd like to do, but I don't know how to get from A to B to C. Can you help me? Can you just help me to get to B? And then I'll, I'll figure the rest out. But when I got to B, I went for another mentor. Can you help me get to C? Till I had I did not need, I became the mentor after the success that I had in my career. But again, young people, don't be afraid of that whiteness because guys, that whiteness is still there. Whatever board, whatever, wherever you go, and right here in Portland, as well as in Washington, D.C., and unfortunately, unfortunately, my agency, the Forest Service, they've gone backwards. There will be that whiteness, but do not be afraid. Find someone who you've observed that you wouldn't mind saying, would you help me? Would you mentor me? Because it's hard to do it without a mentor. Uh -oh, I'm done. I yeah. And what I found in, in the conservation field too, I mean, if you're willing to do the work and kind of roll up your sleeves and do something, I mean, it, it can be very welcoming because they want they want doers, they want people that are going to do things and and help their organizations. So, so Chuck, uh, did you have any mentor or mentors that you'd like to mention? And if so, um, how did they help your career? Uh, Chuck, do you hear me? We might be having a little freeze up here. Uh, Chuck, did you hear the question? I think I've lost sound. Oh. Okay. You got it back. Uh, can you, I, I, I can hear you now. Uh, so would you like me to repeat the question? Or else if you have it, because since I sent it out, you know, you could always pull it up too. I don't think you can hear you, Greg. Okay, let me go to 
uh, Tabitha while Chuck is working on that. Uh, Tabitha, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. So have you had a mentor or, or mentors uh, that inspired you that maybe had an impact on your career? Not not as of yet. I still feel like I'm, I, I have a lot of people within Metro who um, have been extremely gracious with their time and helping me understand how Metro does things, how the Pacific Northwest does things, that because it's quite different from home a lot of times. Uh, so I definitely have a lot of people who help and support me, but not as of yet. I'm looking, I'm searching. <laughs> I will be emailing people after this for sure yeah. <laughs> to, to pick brains and to 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 ask questions. Uh, but I don't have one of yet. I do have a, but I do have a great mentor who helped me um, before I started this field. Besides my phenomenal parents who taught me a great work ethic, uh, Mr. Uh, well now Dr. Stephen Andrews uh, at my college, he taught me the, pa the the beauty of patience and the beauty of being patient while in government work. And that's something that I I often uh, go back to those moments when I was 18 and frustrated that we couldn't get things done as a, in our student government. And just hearing his advice uh, and just being like, okay, he was right then, he's right now. <laughs> and he's, it, it's just gonna take a little longer, but the key is to not give up. And just because it's taking longer to get done, that doesn't mean it's not worth getting done. That doesn't mean that you give up on it. It's that you just try another angle and you just try another person and you just send another email and bring it back to the top of their pile. And you just keep going because you know it's, it's, it's the right thing to do at the end of the day. So I rely on his advice quite a bit, but it's, as far as particularly in this field, I am still looking. <laughs> okay, well, I think a couple of us have already stepped up to volunteer in case you want to you want to reach out. So to do that. <laughs> Definitely. I think you should take uh, a walk of Oxbow for sure. <laughs> okay, I think our, our tech folks behind the scene have been working with Chuck, and he still has a puzzled look on his face. And so I'm, I'm oh, thinking I'm that back. you're good. Okay, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Well, for me, you know, when I, my late grandfather um, was a huge mentor, um, and uh, we are charged as uh, Indian people to um, protect, preserve, and enhance our, our resources. They were given to us by uh, our belief as our creator. We are made of the land. Uh, my skin is the hide of elk. My eyesight comes from eagle. My, my hearing comes from the owl. The veins throughout my body come from the plant people. And so if you are from those things, you have that deep sense of responsibility to um, make sure that those things are protected, regardless of what field you may be in as, as an American Indian from the Columbia Plateau. And then the late Mike Farrow, who was the natural resource director for the tribes for well over 20, almost 30 years. Um, when I was first got out of the service, the first thing he did was uh, take me out on the landscape and walk all of our original land. So walking the 6.4 million acres that we gave and granted the United States. Uh, so starting up into the, uh, what is now the Tri-Cities, Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco, Washington area, and walking those lands all the way down to the Oahe River, uh, and then across to the John Day, and then all the way back up to Willow Creek, and understanding that these, these lands that were ours for thousands of years are what is the responsibility that I have to carry and to preserve and protect those. And then who's still alive and among us now um, uh, from a tribal perspective is Antone Minthorn, the former chair of the Confederate Tribes. Uh, Antone has been a huge advocate, still continues to be, is in his 80s. Um, and um, he's still on the road constantly working for uh, Ecotrust, on the board of Ecotrust, on the board of Confluence Project to ensure that the message gets out there that we all have a responsibility to protect these lands and, and continues to mentor others. And then I think of um, as Gloria said, uh, the, the non-Indians in my life who, who were also mentors and helped. And I would be remiss if I didn't say Senator Hatfield uh, was not one of my favorite mentors. Um, I, I turned him down for a job when I was uh, 17 to be his page. And when I went to to work for the Trust for Public Land, he was the chair. And he only had one question for me. He said, Mr. Sams, if I offer you a job this time, will you not turn me down? And <laughs> It's pretty hard to turn down Senator Hatfield in the first place, um, but you know his steadfast belief in community service, in being a public servant, and helping those along the way to to find their full potential um, and let them discover it, so so that they can be of service to their community. So I think mentors uh, play an extremely important role 
in people's lives and it's particularly in the conservation field and do not be scared as gloria said to have mentors who don't look or act or talk like you um, they're, they're important to find that bridge and, and they will help you uh, be able to make contact and connections that you wouldn't otherwise and the other one would be ethel kennedy who made sure that i had other people to talk to um, as a young environmentalist to be able to understand my role, my job in the uh, environmental field, and to remind me that I also have an obligation to help and teach other young people to come up and, and take these jobs, um, which you know the late Charles Jordan also pushed very hard uh, for those of us uh, who were people of color in the early 2000s to hold like environmental professional color meetings uh, to share our ideas and our experiences and our hardships and to let people know that you're not alone. Okay, thanks, Jack. I'll give a real brief answer because we want to get to our uh, our audience that have some questions in the queue. So I'll just say real briefly, I, I never had a mentor that just kind of took someone under my wing like that, but I've been there. A couple, there have been a couple of people that uh, had actually done my job before, and and then they became my supervisor. And so I found that the people that understood my work the best were my best supervisors. And so they ended up being mentors. Like for instance, with Metro, I was a regional planner for Metro. So I was responsible for doing restoration work, and reforestation work uh, in three counties that Metro works in. And so my supervisor was only a couple of years older than me, but he had been in, he was doing my job. Uh, kind of two people's jobs. So he was glad when I came on because he got to show off some of these properties off to me uh, to manage, develop management plans and, and you know, hire people to do the work on, on those lands. And that was Jim Morgan. And he was a limnologist by training. So he had a, a strong science background. And he was a, a Southern boy from Georgia. So he was just kind of down to earth and, and kind of Sometimes a little off-color jokes sometimes, but um, he was just a very likable person and um, helped me. I, I enjoyed my work a lot because of him. So we're going to go to the audience questions and um, hopefully we can get as many of those in as possible. And so I'm going to open the first one. Um, and I don't know if I should... I don't, probably don't have to say the person's name. They may not want to. They may want to be anonymous. But uh, this person says, I, "I've lived in Oregon for 21 years after immigration from South America. Uh, throughout the years since, whenever I've tried to explore the outdoors, the impression that the woods are the domain of cultural white blue collar culture has been becoming more pervasive. Certainly, more in the current political climate. I personally have been intimidated uh, to leave a public park by." virtue of my appearance as we work to make the outdoors more welcoming and inclusive how do we navigate the possibility of this type of interaction and the potential toxic nature of communities that live around public lands so that's a very good question and uh, did everybody kind of follow that one uh, would anybody like to attack on answer for it mm -hmm. thank you, and thank you for that question by the way that's something that's on all of our minds i'll i'll start I, I think that um, parks around the city are certainly um, seeing what's going on in the street, in the, in the demonstrations, and can be very scary. But if you get away from Portland, if you get away from Eugene, if you get away I don't think you'll find that same experience or any people who would do you harm because whoever is out there on that trail on the Willamette National Forest or at Civil Falls, they don't mean you no harm. And if you went to those places, it would be less scary for you. Well, I think that's that is the case, Gloria. And I and there have been experiences of people of color in the outdoors that have been harassed and frightened, um, and therefore are uncomfortable with going out in wild places. So, the, so there's both. There's there's both. There's that that peacefulness and calm, and a lot of people that you you see out there 
they're out there for the same reason you are, and they are they smile and they say hi and they 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 wave on the trail and that sort of thing. And there are some folks that are right now in this climate feeling, you know, saying, no, no, this is our land, this is our territory, and and you don't belong here, and you go back to where you came from. Those experiences are happening as well. Um, if I could anybody... just speak a little bit, yeah, just a little bit about that. So in my, my role as operations supervisor is managing uh, five full-time ranger staff who does enforcement on our property. And while Oxbow Regional Park is a thousand acre, you know, old growth forest park, it's, uh, having the rangers on on staff uh definitely helps but when i first started there was a hesitancy i think to not i think i know from several instances to kind of to get in those situations because there was a, a hesitancy and an assurance of what to do you know what to do when you see someone being uncomfortable because they're in this space and someone possibly passively being an aggressor or outrightly being an aggressor and this is something that's been a continuous conversation and in training. Um, and I would say, yeah, not only please come to Knoxville Regional Park, try it out, <laughs> you know, let us know your experience, uh, because this is something that we're working on, getting our staff to see it, to cut it off before it escalates, before people have that interaction between themselves, just by having a conversation. And I know not every park has that many rangers in that like, confine of a space, but there are parks out there that do have that. And I think that that mentality hopefully will continue to spread when people like, I wanna be able to go to every park and feel safe because these are all my tax dollars or these are all my ways in, at the end of the day. Um, so, and I, I still carry that with me sometimes when I go to a new park in a new place, there is this concern and I'm looking around at who's here and who's, you know, it's definitely coming from the deep South, a concern when I go into certain places, how, how am I gonna be met and how I'm gonna be seen um, but I've definitely taken a lot of comfort in the work that we've been doing and I'm hoping other agencies are doing as well to kind of put themselves in the middle before park patrons feel threatened and, and afraid to go into these places. So then what I'm hearing, Tabitha, is your response is really to help to prepare your staff and your, and your people that, that these interactions could occur and kind of yes. equip them to be yes. able to intervene, to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. and to help people to feel safe right and and so okay and, and i think as the person that that's going into these places if they're able to make some kind of contact especially if it's a group uh you know with with the agency you just say hey we're going to be we're going to be showing up there and sometimes a a, a ranger may just be looking out for yeah. that group yeah and, and that can kind of help to be a deterrent if mm -hmm. somebody else wants to get a little crazy. Right, yeah, you definitely, you're seeing this isn't going under the radar and this isn't acceptable. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's important to establish for sure. Yeah, Chuck, do you wanna add anything to that or you wanna just go to the next question? We have a few that are coming up. No, I just say the wildest place I've ever been is New York City when I lived there. And <laughs> the advice I ever got was uh, walk fast and walk with confidence and you will eventually get past the group of people that most likely are scary. And I would say the same thing in the woods, walk with confidence and your whole there is to be away from anybody. <laughs> You're not looking for a crowd to be with. So separate yourself between them and you and you, the woods are yours. Yeah, there's some aggressive wildlife there too. I think the species Rattus norvegicus, the Norway rat, they, they get pretty big over there in New York. So anyway, we'll, I'll go to the next question. Uh, as an employer, what are the things I can do to attract and support employees of color? And Tabitha, you talked a little bit about that. Um, would, would anybody else like to talk about that? You know, as, as your, in your role as someone that's responsible for the people and a supervisory role and a supportive role, uh, what can you do to attract uh, and support uh, the employees that you have and attract new employees of color? That, that's a really good question. Uh, who, who'd like to take that on? So, so I would so, say that, you know, I went out and just found and recruited people of color. Go out and do that. So when I was at the Earth Conservation Corps, two thirds of the staff were people of color. We worked with uh, African-American youth from uh, Maryland to Washington, D.C., and Native American youth throughout the Pacific Northwest. So 
physically going out and attracting. And most of my staff did not start off in the natural resource field. They were political science majors, uh, business majors. Um, but similar to you, Greg, having them and identifying that they are really good people uh, skills and getting them into the job spaces. Uh, when I worked for Trust for Public Land, all of my staff were people of color. Again, going out and recruiting folks like Tony DeFalco and Carol Craig of the Yakima Nation and bringing those people in. That's what you do is you go to where they're at and ask them to come and join your team and then making sure that it's an open environment where they are contributors. They're not just taking orders, but they're contributors to whatever is that you're whatever it is you're trying to accomplish in your jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. And I would just add uh, to learn about the organizations that have been formed now specifically for attracting uh, young professionals of color into the conservation field. There's an organization called Diversity Joint Ventures. It's a national organization and there are uh, public agencies and NGOs and universities that are part of Diversity Joint Ventures and their role is to help young people of color, college students to, uh, to connect with employment, uh, to meet professionals, other professionals of color, develop mentors, um, and so that that's one avenue. And I think uh, Danielle will send out some information about diversity joint ventures. Uh, but for folks that are listening in now, diversityandconservationjobs.org is how you get onto the website of diversity uh, joint ventures. Because you know what we hear historically is, well, they're not out there. You know, those people aren't interested in these kinds of careers. Um, you know, they don't have an interest in conservation. They have more basic needs. Uh, and you know, there's there's a lot of reasons and a lot of excuses, frankly, uh, why organizations haven't diversified their workforce. And and sometimes it's just lack of awareness of the resources that are out there because there are people out there, professionals, there are students, there are colleges with large numbers of uh, students of color that are that are studying natural resources, studying life sciences, and they're just not aware of of where they are and who they are. And so they they just need some help. Uh, to figure that out. So, uh, so thank you for that question. Let's see if we can get a couple more yep. in. Yep, this is Danielle. We have five minutes, and then we're definitely going to need to wrap it up at 7:30 on the on the dot. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Actually, it's four minutes now. Uh, all of you mentioned having an experience that sparked your interest in conservation and wildlife. To further increase diversity and conservation in the future, the youth need to be inspired. What can be done in the Portland area, Oregon? and the U.S. to initiate that spark and interest in conservation among minority youth? Well, I, I think the organizations you just mentioned, Greg, is a way, a way to go there. And once we have them, it's our job to inspire them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that connecting environmental organizations, conservation groups with community-based organizations, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the things that Center for the Diversity and the Environment does. And then the outdoor groups that are that have been forming that bring people of color into the outdoors. I'm involved with one called People of Color Outdoors. There's another one called Wild Diversity. There's Latinos Outdoors. Uh, so getting involved with those groups. And so you can personally be a spark in, in, in you know, even if you don't have a lot of natural resource background or conservation background, you may be just like working with kids. You know, you you can you can kind of train up a little bit on on what's out there and and get out and and work with kids. So it's really just that initial exposure that makes a big difference because uh, then it, it you know your face lights up when you see the kids get excited and and then you got you take advantage of that and because uh, because when they learn about nature. And in the, the pressures and the impact on the natural world and human impact, you know, then a lot of times kids start to care and, and they want to start doing something. So so that would be my response. Chuck, do you want to, we have a couple, just a couple minutes and, and Tabitha, you know, anybody else that would like to respond to that? I think that's our last audience question before we wrap up. So again, it's what? What can we do? You know, the youth need to be inspired. What can be done, you know, locally, regionally, nationally to initiate that spark and interest in conservation, especially in, in youth of color? 
I think you you all you hit it on the head directly. It's it's just having those experiences and connecting them. And I think it's definitely one of those things. Like if someone had told me about this and it just been words, even a few pictures, I wouldn't have grasped it as I would like possibly a video. And it's saying, hey, we're gonna go take this field trip. Do you want to go? I'm like, well, where are we going? What are we doing? Because I cannot visualize what we're talking about. I don't have a reference point because this wasn't a part of my world. But if someone had shown me a video and like, this is gonna be your nature education instructor and you guys are gonna talk about this today. Yeah, I'm running home with that permission slip. Like, let's go on this trip, let's do this. Because I, I see it now and it's real now to me. It's not just words that make sense to a lot of people, but to me in my world, it would not have made sense to me. And definitely working with organizations who have those connections already, just tying it all together, I think is, is a huge key and a huge step and huge fan of wild diversity as well, so. Thank, thank you, Tabitha. And I, and I have to say, Tabitha, I think you're, you're an old soul. I, I, I can tell <laughs> already. You just show a lot of maturity. You're, you're still, you know, young in this field and, and you just, um, you have a great career ahead of you. So I, I look forward to oh. hearing about the great things that you do. Thank you so uh, much. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. So we're down to 7.30. Is there anything you'd like to wrap up with, Danielle, before we sign off? No, just thank you so much to the four of you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules to have this important discussion. And um, we'll follow up with everybody tomorrow with an email with some of these resources. Um, and in fact, uh, Oregon Wild is hiring. So we'll also include that job uh, position in there. If anybody is interested, nice. um, please feel free to share it with your network. So no, thank you again to the four of you and, and everybody have a great evening. Okay, I wanna thank everybody that's tuned in. I already got a couple little messages from people uh, showing some appreciation. Uh, so thank you to our panelists for taking time and thanks for everyone that, that's tuned in. And I hope that, uh, thank you Oregon Wild for hosting us and for putting on these seminars. They've been very interesting, educational and, and been a, a big draw for folks. So just keep it going. Nice right, evening. Good night. Bye-bye.